The World Cup ended the only way it could, with one of the most exciting finals the world has ever witnessed. Argentina completely dominated the game for 75 minutes, thanks mostly to Lionel Messi and Angel Di Maria. However, thanks to clever substitutions by the Champs and the individual brilliance of Mbappe, France miraculously found their way back in less than two minutes, taking the game into extra time. Another goal by Messi and a hat-trick by Mbappe took the game to penalties, where Montiel and Martinez allowed Messi to complete his trophy cabinet and bring the World Cup back to Argentina after 36 years. So what were the tactics that allowed Argentina to dominate the game? And how did France find their way back? Let's take a look. Argentina lined up in a 4-3-3, a variation from their 4-4-2 used in their previous matches. France, on the other hand, stuck to their standard 4-2-3-1, with Aubameyang and Rabiot the only changes from their semi-final clash with Morocco. Before looking at the tactics, the stats can help us paint the picture of how the game developed. Argentina ended the game with twice the amount of shots compared to the 2018 world champions. However, it's important to note that France were yet to register a shot on goal until the 71st minute. The location of these shots also helps paint the picture, with Argentina getting into France's box much more frequently compared to the few shots from outside the box they conceded. To understand why Argentina was so dangerous, it's important to understand how they defended, as the vast majority of their chances came from deadly counterattacks. Their first press wasn't too high up the pitch, and kept a flat 4-3-3 shape that allowed them to easily cover France's two holding mids, while also keeping the space between the lines tight in order to not allow Griezmann or Giroud to get on the ball. This shape worked extremely well for a number of different reasons. Firstly, the front three meant France had to keep their fullbacks in Hernandez and Koundé slightly lower for support, meaning Mbappe and Dembele were isolated on the flanks and could easily be outnumbered with the fullback and midfielder shifting to cover. We can see this as early as the fifth minute, Argentina keeping to their 4-3-3 shape, forcing France's fullbacks to sit back. France play a ball forward into Dembele and it's instantly covered by two players, with Di Maria tracking the run of Koundé. Any central pass France attempted was instantly closed down, and France didn't even get a sniff at goal for the whole first half. At times, France would try and overcome this by switching to a back three, Mbappe moving more centrally and Hernandez pushing up. But France would struggle to beat this three-man press, and Hernandez was excellently patrolled by De Paul. Now, this shape is also what allowed Argentina to be so dangerous. Their ability to instantly win the ball back from these passes forward meant Messi, Alvarez and Di Maria were always positioned between the lines, where they could turn and counter-attack as quickly as possible. We can see this in the seventh minute as France attempt a long switch in play. Argentina win the ball back and instantly play it forward, with Di Maria and Alvarez between the lines. An overlap from McAllister and Argentina can instantly outnumber the French defence. Now, for Argentina's more structured attacks, while their formation was a 4-3-3, it rarely resembled this shape, and was more of a lopsided 4-4-2 diamond, with Messi at the tip, Alvarez up top, and Di Maria hugging the touchline. Enzo Fernandez proved why he was the tournament's young player of the year, excellently picking out the offensive set of players with key passes, before finding himself on the edge of the box for support. The space that was left on the right could be filled in a number of different ways, either for long balls in the channel for Alvarez to run onto, or Molina on the overlap, but the most common was usually the Mezzala de Paul moving into this outside channel. The combination of de Paul, Messi and Di Maria consistently created dangerous opportunities, and the fact that Di Maria was always isolated on the flank against Koundé would free up space for McAllister to attack forward. Argentina would constantly look to play the ball into Di Maria either with switches in play or by going through the centre. Either way, this is what led to their penalty to open the scoring and their defensive structure allowed them to instantly hit France on the counter for their second goal. The stats back this up, with 40% of attacks coming down the left flank through Di Maria. This shape and offensive structure is also reflected in Argentina's players' average position throughout the match, with Messi much closer to Alvarez compared to Di Maria. Similarly, France's struggles can be seen in their average positions, with the midfield being completely squished and Mbappe the only outlet high up on the pitch. Di Maria was arguably Argentina's best player while he was on the pitch, winning the penalty and scoring the second goal after a beautiful counter-attack. So this was the theme for the vast majority of the match, forcing the French manager to quickly find a solution. His first gut reaction was to take off Giroud and Dembele for Turam and Mouani to give France a bit more of a cutting edge up top. However, the real trick came with the introduction of Camavinga and Koeman. France switched their formation from a 4-2-3-1 into an all-out 4-2-4 looking to outnumber the defence. Initially, this didn't seem to be working, as France would still struggle to get their key players on the ball. 
However, the pace of Mouani compared to Giroud proved to be vital, beating Otamendi to the ball and winning his nation a penalty. Instantly after that, Koeman wins the ball off Messi and France find themselves level after an incredible finish from Kylian Mbappe. France's more attacking lineup allowed them to be a lot more direct and would waste a lot less time in moving the ball forward, looking for Mbappe or Koeman who could consistently look to dribble inside and create opportunities. Switching to a more dynamic front two rather than a target man in Giroud meant there was more support on the flanks for their key players and could also completely bypass the center where France couldn't gain control for the whole match. Tactically speaking, Argentina dealt with this threat rather consistently. However, it was down to some individual magic that got them back into the game. After the equaliser, the game completely opened up and became one of the most entertaining finals of all time. During extra time, Argentina reverted to their initial build-up structure with Acuna on the left instead of Di Maria, looking to disrupt France's defensive block. However, at this stage, the game was completely open and tactics took the backstage. Lautaro Martinez found himself in behind on different occasions, but was not able to find the net. However, it was Messi once again that put his country ahead after a safe shot from Lautaro Martinez. But Mbappe leveled the scoring after another penalty, before an incredible save by Martinez took the game to penalties. At the end of the match, Argentina was certainly the better side on the night. But that shouldn't detract from France's late push to take the game to penalties and give everyone a memorable World Cup final. In some ways, it felt like a passing of the torch moment, with Messi finally winning the elusive World Cup, and Mbappe showing the world just how good he truly is. And now, let me know what you think. What did you make of the World Cup final and what tactics did you enjoy watching? Let me know in the comments down below. So, the World Cup is over, but it left us with some incredible performances and great talking points for years to come. Why not check out this video on how Morocco could inspire the next generation of tactics? As always, if you enjoyed this content, then please leave a like and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.